But hey there, welcome back today uh, to Retro Tech. Now check out this awesome new television I just picked up right behind me. I was lucky enough to find this amazing Sony KV-1710 from the early 1970s uh, on Facebook Marketplace. But this video is not about that TV. I will have a full feature on that one alone coming soon. Uh, today we will feature two other Sonys though. And uh, we're going to need to do some modifications to those. They're both 20 inches. One's going to get an RGB kit installed. And the other is going to get an S-Video mod installed. So you'll get to see both of those. Uh, just remember, they also go through and I restore each, each of these sets and repair them if they are, at least to a certain level, get them repaired enough uh, to be used again. Because that's just as important as actually modifying them is getting them reliably available and ready to be used. Uh, but before we actually get into any Sony's, I have one more that I want to talk about and show you first. And that's a JVC that was actually sent to my shop. This is a 20 inch JVC. And uh, it's actually quite funny here in the beginning. I want you to see how this uh, started. I'm just going to show you right off the bat. I pulled it into the shop and I tried to power it on and test it. And I, I, I think you're going to be quite shocked uh, by what was happening here. Well, that doesn't sound right. Ooh, goodness, this one's feisty. I don't feel anything on the tube. Uh-oh. This is a JVC, model number AV20321, pretty bare bones, 20 inch white TV here. And as you can tell, when we turned it on, it's got a problem. I'm not sure what that is. It's pretty darn dirty. Uh, it's gonna need to be taken apart because it wasn't getting any power to the screen and something definitely sounded bad inside here. Since this is hanging out of it, this makes me think that someone's opened this up and looked inside it before. Because that should be secured in there and doesn't normally just pop out like that. Alright, so let's open it up and see what we can find out. I need to remove this to see what's going on. In oh my gosh. Oh my goodness, holy crap, look at that. Whoa, 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 hang on there, Bordy. Look at that. Whoa. Look at this thing. Look at this thing. What? Of course it didn't work. The daggum anode cap was unplugged. Look at this. I swear I've never opened this one. The yoke is disconnected here. Um, speakers are disconnected. I mean, I definitely was not expecting that at all. Look at that. I'm not really worried about those speakers, they're, but they're both disconnected. Also, the degausser is disconnected. Look at that. Um, but look, what the heck, man? Sheesh, literally never seen that. I've never, ever, ever seen that. And so I'm going to put this back in here and we'll try to restart it. And see if it is okay or if it's truly got a bad problem. I was not expecting that at all. And it makes me wonder if I shouldn't just always open the CRT before I even try it from now on if if that's gonna be if that's gonna be happening holy crap wow everything looks good I've reconnected everything checked out stuff made sure it is connected and hopefully We'll see something um, on the screen. There's still some unpopulated points on there. Hopefully those are just test points. I don't see any other plugs, but let's see what happens 
when we power it on. I've got it plugged up to my isolation transformer just to be safer. Turn on power there. Let's see. Kind of hurt it there for a second. Let's see. Yeah, look. <laughs> my goodness. So, all right. Wow. Yeah. So, looks like it works. Uh, let's press start on that controller. I just can't believe that. Yep. I can't believe that thing had the anode cap unplugged, the deflection yoke unplugged, everything pretty much unplugged. Wow. It's working. Let's see if it zaps. It's been running for a little bit. Let's see if there's any charge left in it. Oh yeah, there's some good charge right there. Bing, bang, boom. We're about to take a closer look at the boards and see how the modification looks on there for RGB. And again, I must say thank you to Sector Sunthar for sending me a lot of these little kits he's got. Uh, on his website. I'll post those in the description of the video. You can go there and pick up these kits. Uh, what we're going to do now is again look at the board closer where the modification is installed and I'll show you more about navigating through Sector Sunthar's website. Let's take a look at some of these upgrades closer. I have of course been referencing Sector Sunthar here for this kit and this particular TV is not on this list but it is the same chassis as this guide here but that's where we're going to inject RGB and blanking and then we're going to have to use composite video and audio on the back so I've done all that right in here let me show you everything that's happened uh, I've cleaned all this up I did have to remove these three surface mount resistors that one right there that one right there and that one right there and then on the end of these capacitors, I injected red, green, and blue. Over here is blanking, which is right on the side of this resistor R35 on this end, not on the inside, on the outside. And then over here is a ground point simply for that orange wire to go to. Uh, down here, purple is a second ground point. Uh, this one is a black, black cable is a ground point. And then over here I have left and right audio and composite video for sync. And let's see, what else do you need to know? Uh, it looks like this particular TV set has basically mono audio sent together. Or, you know, you get your stereo audio hookups, but I think it's just sent in as a single audio signal and then split again out the front uh, right here. And so that's interesting. I did recap and rebuild this block because the sound was so bad on this set. Hopefully that will help it out and the speakers aren't blown. Uh, but that's the RGB mod. So again, up here is where we're going red, green, and blue. Removing that. And sync, audio, ground, ground. All the good stuff. Thanks to Sector Sunthar. Then we can use this to plug into the MUX board, which again is directed down here how to build it right all in that table. Everything's hooked up and I've got RF going into it right now through the N64. But what I really want to try out is this RGB kit and see if it's hooked in correctly. Now it's MUXed, so it doesn't need a switch. All I should have to do is turn it off on this and then um, let's turn the TV into a different input video one let's try video one because that's going to be the one we'll turn on and then we've got RGB it's very dark let me Turn up the tube there, and there we go. Look at that. Holy moly. Folks, we have RGB now on this JVC. Thanks to the MUX kit. So I'm trying to think of like a simple way to explain how this MUX kit 
and these MUX RGB mods work. And the way they work is these uh, jungle chips actually accept red, green, and blue in, and they're normally accepting that for the OSD or the on-screen display uh, that displays the menus and things. Well, that's coming in raw into the chip in the RGB format through those RGB lines. And the way that the RGB kits work is they basically go in and hijack that line. So it's telling the TV, hey, go into OSD pull-up mode. And instead of showing just the menu, well, let's show whatever else we inject along those lines on the red, green, and blue line. Mostly in the form of the video input in SCART. And then you sync your image using, most of the time, composite video or Luma for sync if you have S-Video. You can use that too. So you're basically hijacking that pathway and you're sending in your own signal. Now the way the MUX works is there's voltage coming up a couple of the paths or at least one of the paths in the SCART head and then that SCART head voltage is tuned and it sits in there and it sends in the OSD signal to tell it to be activated. Uh, the traditional mods would have a switch where you would manually send in that tuned voltage is generally between 3 to 5 volts DC, sometimes less, sometimes more. But you would send that voltage into the OSD and it would, or into the blanking signal, and it would turn on the RGB input or the OSD input or whatever you want to call it. So traditionally that was done prior with a switch. Now the MUX board allows us to do that because there's SCART, there's voltage coming up from the SCART cable. So when that SCART cable actually sends that voltage into the SCART input that we're installing here today on this TV, it tells the TV to go into RGB mode. This is the shell. Here's the MUX board that's already got all the resistors and everything that we talked about right in there. And it's installed on the side here to be out of the way. And now all I've got to do is bring that over here and test fit it right there. And hopefully it'll be good. We can get it Closed up. Yeah, everything's pieced together nicely. I think this came out pretty clean. The input itself. This TV is a little awkward with all the vents and like changes in plastic as far as like depth and the form of the mold here. And then also back behind like this area is a giant heat sink that blocks you from really using that part to install the scart head. The only other option would have been something like up in this area and I felt like that was just too congested. So I decided to put it over here. Works nice, or looks nice. It fits as far as all that's concerned. Now it is right next to the power cable, but that shouldn't really be an issue. Let's see how it works. We're gonna do some tests now with it and see just what happens. My SCART cable is fed directly from my Super Famicom, which is powered on. I have power going into the set. And let's see if it's on the right input to start. Okay, video one. There you go. That is RGB. We do get a horizontal shift here on the picture a little bit. And that is due to the... Uh, composite shift while well, we're using that for sync this set does not have s video so we can't use s video for sync on luma and we're going to have a shift horizontally pretty good shift between uh, composite rf and then moving up to rgb great so i just wanted to check the sound out The sound is really bad out of this left speaker. I'm feeling like it's blown out or something or other because I did rebuild that whole audio block on the circuit board and it still just doesn't sound that great. All right, guys, so the audio is actually quite a bit better if you pull it out of the TV itself and like externally use it. Thankfully, with this TV set, it's got this stereo audio input right here, or output. 
So you could literally just use this type of a cable and go over to anything that has audio uh, capabilities for a receiver and just bypass the onboard speakers if you want to because honestly I don't have the right size speaker to replace those and there still may be some issues with like the analog sound board on this set. Um, I don't know. I would prefer to not waste a lot of more time trying to perfect a couple of tiny speakers that may never sound that great to begin with. The other thing I wanted to try out here was actually running the audio out from this point with just these standard cables out the back and we we're going to see if that was going to make any difference. So I'll hook that up next. Let's see how that sounds. All right, so running audio back here to the audio out also is working, but I want to try something and see. I think the problem with doing it that way So what happens here is if I'm using the volume on the TV here, uh, I have to turn it all the way down. And will that let me turn this up? Or Yeah, so I can still turn up my stereo receiver and turn it all the way down here and get good audio. So I would recommend... Let me turn it down. My recommendation with this TV is going to be to use those outputs and get much better audio uh, either way you want to do it uh, should be fine I would use the outputs get better audio and use the superior screen inputs here for uh, RGB how awesome is that though I mean this set looks amazing in RGB If you're fortunate enough to have the remote for this television set, you can get into the service menu and make some adjustments. To get into the service menu, all you really have to do is press sleep timer, and while it displays zero on the screen, you press display and video status simultaneously. And there's about 20 things you can shuffle through in there. The only ones that are really going to make any difference are your horizontal size and position and vertical size and position. Everything else you should pretty much leave alone in that setting. And then you can just hit exit a couple times on the remote and it'll back out and save your settings. Um, that's really all the adjustments you get. This is RGB again, but on this particular set, one of the downsides of RGB modding it is while it's in RGB, you have no control over brightness or picture slash contrast. So those settings are disabled on RGB. Now you can still use those settings on RF and the composite inputs, but you don't get that on RGB, so you have to kind of tune this using the flyback screen voltage just to make sure you get enough image, and uh, I didn't have any issues with it the way it looks on this set, but I just did want everybody to know that, that you cannot use brightness or contrast controls with this particular jungle chip when you RGB mod it. And this set does not have a red push. Um, I didn't have to make any adjustments to the red or colors really at all in this set. This is RGB again. And it looks pretty balanced. I will also note that we did a good job of tuning our RGB signals because I can see the definition between each uh, block here. It's going to be really difficult to show on the camera, but I can definitely see even the F block, E block, D block, etc. So it's looking really great. The color's balanced. The geometry's good on this TV. Everybody, I'm not sure what else to say about this one, except it's, uh, it's a really great mod that turns what would be a pretty inferior TV set into something that is really quite cool. Now there are other white models of these JVCs. There's obviously a black model. And so if you see this in black and it has the same model number, it won't have the same model number actually. It'll be a zero at the end instead of the one. But 
you can modify that too. So I would highly, again, highly recommend adding this to such a set that doesn't even offer S video. Yeah. Just so cool. So not every CRT is going to be RGB moddable. Uh, but sometimes there are other modifications that you can do to sets that, again, cannot be RGB modded. So this next Sony I'm going to show to you, uh, again, is a composite-only model. And it looks a lot like the JVC we just worked on. But it cannot be RGB modded. Let's see what we can do to it. And uh, maybe Cole can help out and uh, get everybody pumped for this next one. What do you think? <laughs> You're definitely an excited dog, aren't you, Cole? Yes, I love it. I love it. Oh, you don't know what in the world is happening here in this game. But it looks great in RF on this Sony TV. Really? That is RF. RF. So impressed with the RF these days. All right, let's turn this sucker down. This is our new project of the day. Thank you to Justin for sending this one in. Lovely Sony Trinitron here from the 90s. We have a headphone jack there. Looks like we got stereo audio here. Hopefully it's true stereo. TV video button. So we do have an input that is different than RF. That is, oh yeah, it does have stereo. Video, composite video that is. There's RF that I've been using. November of 1996. Uh, from the Mexico facility, the KV... 20 s 21 there you go classic 90s trinitron except for this one's in the white slash cream color let's get this shell off here let's see what it looks like on the inside it's pretty rare to get a zap with a sony tube so let's just see though if we get anything here on the ground wire there on the DAG. Let's just see what happens. Ooh, we actually did get a zap on this Sony tube. Nice. We get another one? Nope, just that one. This is the BA3 chassis from Sony and it is isolated right I guess hot and cold it looks like it's got a lot of parts that are just pertaining to the power this is where the power mains come in here and then all the voltage is sent off here in low voltage doses to the rest of the monitor that's what it looks like the rest of the CRT excuse me I've cleaned it up some now Unfortunately, the BA3 is not RGB moddable, but I was referring to some notes over here on the CRT database about an S video mod for this set or this chassis. So let's test this and see if it works. It's pretty easy. I need to remove a jumper, um, which is labeled R308. And if we look down here, we can do that pretty easily. I've already marked where R308 is. It's right here. So I'll just remove this jumper, and then we'll follow these instructions and try to get S-Video to work in here. First thing I'm going to do is introduce some fresh solder in here to the jumper.
And I think I'll just try to use this to get this out, the solder wick. Okay, let's make sure that's loose. Move it on that side. Move it on that side so it's broken free. Let's flip it over. Well, actually. I wonder if I can come in here and bend these legs out a little bit. Should be able to pull it out now. And before I do that, I'm going to make sure there's solder on this one. Right there. Okay. that jumper right there should be able to just pull it right up like that actually let's get this in there so there's that jumper right there just removed from R308. All right, according to the guide, I need to put the chroma signal in that spot right there where the arrow is. And that spot is over here on the board in this area, and it's this one. So I'm going to install that on a pre made wire I have, and I guess. I'll go hmm, and insert this right here for my chroma wire. Hmm, okay. There we go. Okay. There's the top side of that cable. I'll just come in here and solder this into place. Just like that. And then we can inject ground and luma right there on our input for composite, which is right over here. So I'll stick my ground on there, right here, and then my luma connection right here. So let's do that. Get some fresh solder on here. I'm 
I'll try to keep this all out of the way. Whoops. Okay, that's pretty good. Now we can just really assemble a little S video plug with the other end of this. Whoops. Where'd that go? Oh, there it went. Anyway, if I can assemble an S-Video plug here, we can run a good test and hopefully get S-Video into this. So let me figure out the rest of this and we'll go from there. Now I have finally wired up a test head here with Luma, Chroma, and Ground right there on this this video head, I've got a connection here. Now my red one melted, so I went with a yellow one. See, I ruined my poor red one. So, thankfully I had a yellow one, so that's in there. That's all connected. Now we just need to set this cleaned up chassis back in the tube area and should be able to just test this on uh, video input. Like, it should just come straight through the video input. Let's see what happens. First things first, let's test RF again, and RF should not interfere with this mod at all, so I could really just switch over from RF to S-Video by popping in the cable adapter, and that's it. So let's see what happens. Hopefully I didn't screw anything up and prevent it from working. Sounds good. Sounds normal. Let's see. There we go. Well, I don't actually know. Let's see. Interesting. So I'm losing color. Okay, so I definitely... Uh, maybe I shouldn't have that plugged in at the same time. Or maybe RF isn't working. Let's see what happens. See, so yeah, no color. Let's see if the color comes back. If I unplug this, just unplug that adapter and see what happens. No, still no color. Okay, well, that's not good. Let's see, um, maybe that resistor will prevent color. Uh, let's just see what happens when we switch over to video. We're in video. I'm going to plug that back in. All right, let's test out this uh, S video. Maybe it'll work. Maybe I have something connected incorrectly. Like, well, no, that's working fine. That's actually S video right there. So if that's this video, why is the does that resistor rerouting that make the RF signal not work color anymore? This video works though. All right, well I've switched over to composite video. You see, it's come over here now. It says in the guide, don't put uh, don't put both of them in at the same time because they're both using that same input. So you can't plug in and run both signals at the same time. I don't think it would hurt it to plug it in. And uh, let's just see if that gets any darker. It says it could get darker, but if I'm not sending a signal in, will it get darker? Okay, let's see. Oh, uh, yeah, see, so the color's gone. Interesting. If I unplug that... Let's see, nothing, 
but let's go plug in this video, see if... There we go, we have color. Okay, so we can't have color on both those inputs at the same time. I wonder if you'd have to have a switch or something involved to make sure that RF still works. Interesting. All right, everybody. So I've been playing around with the set for a little bit. You can hear the music coming from the speakers. So the way that this works again, we've got audio left and right in here in the composite input. And then we're using S-Video here for video. And then that's all hooked up fine. The issue is for that modification is again, I think it's got a jumper on there, or I think when that jumper is removed, it removes the ability for color to come through on the set. So I'm going to try to see about maybe installing some type of a switch and possibly putting the other switch back into that jumper hole and closing that jumper off with the switch one way, open the switch and have it basically VS video mode. We'll see what happens. Well, I'm going to pop this tube again and I need because I need to remove that chassis and uh, see how bad it sparks this time. baby love that sound well I went in here and I added a switch that well the way it's connected right now is in normal jumper mode so hopefully that'll give me color on RF and then if I switch it over to up it's gonna engage the jumper to the SCART or SCART to the S video head instead and then hopefully doing this will make RF work as well as S-Video and composite. But I don't really know. Let's see what happens when I throw it in this tube and fire it back up. All right, time to run the big experiment. First off, I do have S-Video still connected. And let's see. Oh, got a power. Got to plug that one in down here. Okay, let's see what happens. All right, sounds like it's coming on. There we go. Still going through S-Video. I've disconnected S-Video, plugged in RF. And let's see. We're in black and white. Um, let's power it off just to be safe. And we'll come back here and flip this switch over to the other mode. Come on, baby. Show me some color. There. Yes. Channel 3, RF mode. We still getting volume? Oh, um, yes, 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 yes! If I just flick the switch while this is running, let's see what happens. I'm gonna flip it off, and there it goes. It's, it's in no color mode. So let's just go ahead and switch over there and there we go look at that don't need to worry about anything we figured it out no yes boy man you have rf and s video and composite yeah i'm still working on this thing and i've been able to install my little switch down in here and it's hidden well you see right now it's in that s video mode 
Now if I click it over, it doesn't not do S video, but it gets a lot of weird noise um, interference. So I go back over here and this is S video mode, okay? Now I've got the RF cable plugged in the back of the TV and I'm going to plug in that. We're still in S video mode. Let's go to channel three and see it's black and white there. But if I click back over to the right, then it is color. So that's my way of getting around. And, and, and it does seem to have a better picture when it's on the selected switch. I mean, the RF looks really good on this TV. I'm, I'm quite surprised by it. But anyway, that's RF mode. And then we're going to go over here and go back to... This video mode right there and then I've got the back ready I just need to clean it we'll install it and uh, make it look a little bit more permanent with that S video input I did have to put two screws in just to make sure that the shell was in place and would stay I know I've got the S video input plugged in with stereo audio and then RF. And so we're going to send RF in first. Should already be going from the console right there. And let's see. I can, I can definitely hear it. Okay. Let's see if there's any changes. Okay. Yep. That's probably S video mode. All right, there we go. RF is right here. This is working fine. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect the RF. And then I'm going to switch over to S-Video mode. And let's just keep the signal going in there. And there we have S-Video. Let's turn the volume up. Coming out of both sides. There we go. And there we have S video. Everything looks nice and good back here. Let's test composite video just for the heck of it. All right, composite video and audio works fine. I don't see much of a difference with the switch on the composite input. I'm not sure about if that's really doing anything for that input, but that doesn't really matter. That's more for the modification. So everything seems to be working good on this CRT. All right, I realize I was a little redundant there and went through things a few times, but I wanted to make sure that everything worked properly when I put it all back together. And one more thing, I did actually need to go and install a 0.1 microfarad inline capacitor on the chroma line on the input for the S video. So it's just a straight inline capacitor that I added. And then I also added a 75 ohm resistor uh, to ground on that chroma line just to make sure that the signal was tuned and wouldn't cause any more additional interference on any of the other inputs. So that's something that was actually not in Andy King's kit or guide the day I did the mod. And so funny enough, he updated it like the day after I finished the mod and had all those noted in there. So if you go back and you check out the mod um, guide for this S video mod, which I'll link also in the description here, you can see the more details on how to do this mod, but it's a great mod. The TV works awesome. And that's going to be it for this little S-Video uh, Sony KV. What are you doing?
Where'd you go? What are you doing? You get back over here. You get back over here. Where did you go? What? What are you doing under there? What is it? Have you lost it? Huh? You better get it. Huh? What is that? All right, crazy boy, come here. Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? Oh, you. Okay, good boy. What? Well, it looks like that crazy dog's ditched me for this uh, last repair. And thank you for hanging out this long. Um, so far, I've still got one more repair slash restoration and mod for you. And of course, like a fool, I've saved the very best and most detailed uh, version of these mods for the last video. So again, thanks for hanging around and really loving CRTs because you're going to get to see the best um, version of an RGB mod video that I have. So what we have now is this amazing Sony um, that is actually eligible for the RGB mod. So that's what we're gonna do now. Let's take a look at this Sony and get it up to par. Here we've got a Sony KV-20S40 from January of 99 with the BA4 chassis. And since that other JVC CRT was all apart. I decided to open this up before I even turned it on. Look at this. Definitely been some kind of like liquid spilled inside of here. I'm guessing some root beer or maybe some Dr. Pepper. My goodness. Looks pretty nasty. Lots of rust on the yoke shield right there. You see got that yoke shielding right there. You got all this stuff on the bottom here at the board area. A lot of sticky stuff in here. Very dirty. Grungy. Look at that. We got a spider web in there. Pretty good spider web down in there. See a dead spider. I don't see anything alive. Uh, spring is super rusty. Man, this one's rough. Holy moly, this one is really rough. Look at the shielding over here on the RF. That is super rusty. I'm concerned. I'm concerned about the bottom of this board being super rusty, to be honest with you. Let's hope that's not the case. Um, I am going to attempt a power on test here. Now, this one is isolated. And I'm still going to be safe and run it through my isolation transformer. Let's hook up uh, composite and see what happens. I've got all that powered on, and then I've got my ketchup, mayo, and mustard plugged in down there. And let's power on the TV and see if anything happens here. Kind of hear it. I feel the tube. Let's see if anything comes on the screen here after a minute. Oh, look there. 
So, just like a good old rock, like a Chevy, TV manages to work fine, right? I'm going to let it run for a little bit, see if it has any problems. All right, I've let it run here, and I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Let's see what happens. There's a little bit of, like, squiggly stuff going on in the image. Let's see. It's like squiggly stuff in this image right here. Uh, probably bad capacitors in power filtering or something. Anyway, I'm going to take it apart now. Let's get a closer look at this chassis and see if it actually does uh, have any rust on it. Wow, this one's acting crazy. So I popped the cap off like I normally do. And look, you probably shouldn't do that if you don't want to get zapped because I just got zapped. <laughs> so this is not a tutorial how to not get yourself zapped because I just got zapped. But I'm okay. I didn't even... I didn't even poo my pants or anything. So, I, this thing's making a wacky noise though, because I pulled it off, and if it seems like the energy's rebuilding, I definitely don't think it has a uh, resistor built in. Let's see, let's see if we get a good zap here. Still, whoa, man! See, so some of that popped off and hit me, but oh my goodness, it was like rebuilding and rebuilding and rebuilding. But what I did was I popped the cap off. You know, like that, and still, being like that, some of that arc jumped over here and hit me on the thumb. And obviously it wasn't all the energy from that, but wow, that'll wake you up in the morning. Wow, look at this board. Uh, there's a ton of just garbage on here. I'm hoping this is dirt and not actually, like, rust. I don't see rusting on traces or anything like that let me get some more light in here and see if that will help out but you can definitely see something probably that soda pop that was spilt inside of this thing has done a number in here and uh, we're gonna look at the other side here in a second but definitely have some nasty stuff on this board and over here for example these are resting on this side all these little buttons the framing of them doesn't look very good so I'm really gonna have to clean this board let's look at the neck socket I mean it's pretty solid built CRT so it's not malfunctioning and see this isn't really as bad so that's just mostly from that spray on but you're getting a little rust to develop there see that all right so um, before I do any modifications, I really do want to clean this thing and um, probably recap some of it. Now this board is just way too big to fit into any kind of ultrasonic cleaner or anything. And I don't actually even own any ultrasonic cleaners. So my approach is quite simple. I use a larger old beach towel and just some isopropyl alcohol. And what I do is simply coat, let's say, the bottom half of that board and take a retired toothbrush here. And I'm just going to do this over this whole board. Um, and I'll just introduce more alcohol as I need to and let it kind of sink down there to the bottom and wipe off. As you can see, a lot of stuff comes right off. So. That's what I'll do. I'll show you what it looks like after that because there's a second step that's kind of important after this one. All right, up to this point, all I've done is what I've shown you. I've used the brush and the alcohol and I've rubbed it off. You can see all that nasty stuff that's come off. And then I'm not afraid to take this towel and just dab this board a little bit. <clears throat> but now it's going to need to take a minute and dry up. Now, hopefully we can speed that up a little bit by adding some air. Let's see if that will help. Now well, surprisingly this board cleaned up a lot better than I thought it would. Um, but normally you may run into a situation where you get a hazy 
powder of dust and dried alcohol that remains on your board. I do have a little bit of it like right here. So what I do to clean the board off finally is I take this brush, which is a little coarse, but it's non-conductive. And I just run this brush over here to get all those dust particles that have dried up, knocked off. And you can even do a couple directions on there. I'm going to come back and just brush everything. Um, this portion has been cleaned, and I actually didn't clean this portion at all intentionally, so you can see a difference there of before and then literally after. Cleaning makes a big difference on this board. Now you can properly inspect things, and we'll be able to easily go in here and spot bad solder possibly also it will make recapping the set a lot easier anyway that's what i'm going to do i'm going to get in here and i'm going to fully service this board and uh, the little c board here i'll do the same thing to it then i'll clean them up and i'll show you what it looks like with the new cap kit in and we will install the rgb mux kit after all that's done I just removed the capacitors that I will be removing for this cap kit and they're all gone they're gone from over here on the seaboard and the total is uh, 33 how about that 33 capacitors in this kit and what that encompasses is everything that's pretty much in the hot area and um, even stuff that's not in the hot area that's over 10 microfarads. So anything that's 22 microfarads and up on a capacitor gets changed no matter what. Anything that's over 50 volts on a capacitor that gets changed no matter what, except for this one. I keep these around, these high-end, super big filter capacitors like this. I always test them, and this one's testing perfectly fine. And if there's no problems with them, I tend to not change that one. But everything else that was larger and then there are some that are like right next to heat sinks this was only a one microfarad but I went ahead and changed it because it's too near, close to this heat sink and then everything that's in like the deflection zone and power supply gets changed um, out no matter what but when I look at like other caps in these areas if they're in good shape and look good and then test good if they're 10 microfarads or lower I don't really waste my time changing them especially, like I said, in the cool zones. All right, I'm going to install the new ones. That's all 33 of those capacitors right there. Make sure to drink out of this cup and not that cup, Steve. Well, this board has been recapped now and cleaned up. And um, also, I've had to reflow a lot of solder and things like that. But I think it's good and everything's ready. And I'm going to throw it in and run a test on it and let it run for a while. Hopefully it'll work fine. And uh, then we can take it apart again and install the MUX kit if there's no issues. But you can tell that I did clean <laughs> a little bit of this area back here. I don't really like to use too many solvents. So I tried to clean as best I could without affecting the aqua dag coating. On the tube but I've got everything connected in here um, triple checked it all hopefully that everything's good because it's time to run a test I've got both my video game consoles plugged in there really the only thing I need to do is I need to turn on the isolation transformer send electricity into this set and hopefully everything will work Definitely getting no signal here. Let me see. All right, well, I got it to power back on, and all I really did was I disassembled it and blew out all the connectors with some more compressed air because sometimes when you're cleaning these things, um, you can lose contact by still having a little bit of uh, wet isopropyl alcohol 
from cleaning the boards on things. Now, the good thing is, is that's not conductive, so it's not going to short out anything. Actually, our image cleared up from all that jumpy stuff that was on there uh, that I saw at the startup, so that's good. It was a capacitor or something like that that was repaired. Let's try Chrono's trigger here. Let me volume up. There we go. Okay. Alright. So that's composite video. Seems to be working fine. Sounds working good. Let's try RF. Uh, I've only got channel doggone 7 on here, okay? Alright, well, sadly, my remote control seems to have crapped out on me, but I was able to get over into RF mode and uh, using the menu button. And so everything seems to be working here fine. I'm going to let it run for probably an hour. Then I'll disassemble it and start installing that RGB MUX kit. Look at Mario, looking good. Well, let's remove the circuit board to RGB mod. Let's see if it sparks. There you go, a little spark. Just making sure it doesn't spark again. I'm back on Sector Sunthar's website looking at the guide for this particular television. Television? Excuse me. And naturally, we're going to go between the jungle chip and the OSD chip and uh, insert our signal. And to do that, we need to remove three resistors right here that are, I'm sure, sh ground resistors where they've got red, green, and blue going to ground. And then there's our blanking red, green, and blue signals. That's where they need to go. And then we do need to install three diodes, lift some resistors and install some diodes to clean the signal up. And then we'll need to do ground, left, right audio and sync. And that will be it. And then we can add our RGB input. So let's go down here and see where these parts are. So from what I've been able to tell down here are the red, green and blue colors See those three surface mount capacitors right there? And right next to that is the blanking signal right there. And then that line goes under those capacitors and it hits this 100 ohm resistor. And then it goes through here and then onto this patch where it goes diodes come in here and a bunch of things flow in here. I'm guessing that this is our new blanking point. So I'm probably going to tee into this uh, point right here where either this inductor is or I might come down here. Since all this is on the same point, I might come in here. Um, at the end of this diode. Don't think that's going to make a difference. As far as red, green, and blue are concerned, they'll go right here. And then I can find another ground to connect to. So what I need to do right now is remove these three surface mount resistors. All these resistors do is tie each color to ground. So this side's ground over here and this side's the color. So again, we're going to remove R0878 and 89. And to do that, I'm just going to flood these points with fresh solder. There we go. Oops. <laughs> Reattached it. There we go. There's one down. Two down. Number three down. Get rid of those. Let's clean up the area with some solder wick. There we go. That should be good.
There we go. Now see, we've decoupled them from ground now. So I'll go ahead and introduce some fresh solder to these three points then for when I install the conductors. And actually, let's remove the old solder and just use fresh solder on this point. So it'll be much nicer and easier to work with. And then let's go over here. And that's where we'll do our blanking signal. So I'll come in here now and put fresh solder in here. And then really anywhere over here that's a ground, I can find a fresh ground point. Let's see. Of course, any of these old points over here are grounds, right? And this has all been decoupled, but these are grounds. This is a ground. So what I'm thinking about doing is I'll probably come in here and attach to this little end right here. See this C026? So this is where we'll stick that ground cable. Well, it turns out that I probably want to pull these three resistors uh, and get them out and install a diode uh, in between that resistor and then my conductor to help with signal interference and noise. So we're going to reduce that, have a better tuned signal. We're going to introduce some uh, diodes in here. So to do that, we're just going to remove this leg of the resistor on all three of these colors first that I just tinned up nicely, right? <laughs> so just remove all that fresh solder. And then what I like to do is just, you know, check, make sure that's loose. Same thing up here, same thing up there. And I may come back here and make sure I get anything that's trying to hide under those points on the resistor right there. I'll get all that out of there. Suck it on up in that spongy solder wick. Each one of these legs should be released, and then we can pull it through the other side. All right? Yeah, that looks pretty good. Good. And good. Let's see if we can't lift these now. There's one. There's two. Number three. Okay. So now I need to insert a diode in here and attach it to the legs of each one of these resistors. Here is a 1N4148 diode. So I'm going to stick this through with this dark end of the diode facing down towards the board like that. Let me show you. So I'll feed that through like that, and then I'll come up here and I'll solder the leg of the diode so it's in that direction according to the manual. So temporarily I'm holding my diodes in place with that tape. I will remove that. It's not the best tape to use, but it'll do the trick. Remove that tape, and then I'm going to actually kind of straighten these guys a little bit like that. Same thing with the others. I don't really want to pull them through the hole, but whoops. There we go. Okay, and we'll snip those. Put 
Then we can flip over to our other side. Let's see what we've got going on over here. There we go. Quite a mess. All right. So now set things up. There we go. And I've got my diodes here. And we'll connect them to a resistor. Then I'll come back over here and put some heat sink on them after that. Or some heat shrink tubing, sorry. Let's go work our way back to front. So we'll start back here with the far one. Let's introduce a little solder right in there. We'll go to the second one. And then finally, our third one. Let's make sure everything's connected. Yes. Yes, my friends, connection. We're making a connection here. Wonderful. Let that cool for a moment. And number three. So that's the resistor and diode modification right there. Let's make sure everything's okay. Might come back here and clean up this weld and this weld and this weld. Oops, don't want them to bridge. Oh boy, I got all three of them bridging there. Okay. Trying to clean up the welds here and I bridged them. That's all good. Here we go. Maybe we'll take a little of that extra solder off there too. There we go. Okay, good. Now I'm just gonna stick some heat shrink tubing on here so that nothing shorts against itself inside of this set and let's see if these will work this might be too big i'm not sure i generally come in here with my uh, soldering iron to do this i know you're supposed to technically use a heat gun or something else but this is the handiest thing Snip off that bit. Let's get in ready to install the conductors in here. It says blue is the first one that we want. So I'll go in here since I've cleaned this. I'll add some fresh solder to each one of these points. Green, red's in here somewhere. There you are, red. The brown on the outside. Let's get the red one in here. So blanking should go like under there, right there. But I don't really know that I like that as much. What about? Instead, throwing it right here, right there, 
Probably have to throw some fresh solder right there first. And we'll see if this is going to be a good appropriate spot for blanking up or not once we get it turned on. Yeah, let's go for blanking there. Okay. Now again, a lot of people don't add this extra ground here on their installs. Which is fine, but for mine I like to add the extra ground. I like to have the whole ground loop connected on everything. Just like that. All the conductors are good and in place. Well, this is the conductor line. Red, green, blue, blanking, and ground right there. And then I've, of course, attached some glue here to hold the cables in place. And we've got a ground, a ground audio left and right there. The two light cable Right audio, left audio, and then composite sync. Alright, so I breezed through the section about building this little scart head right here. But again, it's super simple. Each one of these uh, guides that you'll find on Sector Sunthar will tell you where to put your resistors, what the value is, and if you need a diode. Sometimes you just need to put a uh, jumper in instead of a diode. But whatever the case is, it will give you a guide information on there. And then you just have to solder this together, so it's not a big deal. I'm going to turn that down. This is RGB SCART, and this is the first time firing it up. I didn't even have to change anything. And I'll show you this closer in a second. The only thing I did was I built this SCART head right here, which is really just nothing more than one more diode same style diode we used to tune the signal on on the board and then 75 ohm resistors and 1000 ohm resistors and then just soldering that board so we'll have to mount this on the other side of the shell here i'm not sure where this will be going um it looks like there's a nice gap above the input for composite video so we may have a gap to put it in really anywhere where my hand is right here so we should be able to easily flip this up and over and have the scarred input going right there oh baby we got look at this we got ethel ethel's lovely tv here i guess let's get the water out of there whoa those all ethel's Nastism out of here. Scrub it, scrub it, scrub it just like your car, baby. Look at that lovely brush action. I'm trying to decide where I'm going to install the Mux board uh, scart input. And I want it to kind of be like this so that I can seat that cable up top. And then that means the SCART cable will be angled towards this direction. And so that's going to be over in this area right here, which, yeah, should be a little bit higher than the capacitors behind it. And then we do want the cables pointing up and back towards the boards. So like this can flip up, probably over here, come over and plug in right where my finger is right here so we got to dremel out a spot to put that scart right here i think i used my stencil and just a pencil and drew around here and that's a little rough obviously um, i'm going to try to keep it under the letters on this and i'm going to use this straight line here in the plastic texture difference that's already on the uh, set naturally to guide that in and then just to show you this is a good idea is to try to like see what this will look like when it's actually installed and this will go in right here you know the scart cable and then as i said it should have clearance there 
to at least be maneuverable either away from the RF or like just it I don't think it's going to interfere with anything kind of going this direction I feel like that's probably the best way to do it I'm just going to use my Dremel 4000 and uh, just a tiny drill bit and I'm going to go in here and cut this plastic inside that and just drill it out it's going to look real rough at first but after I do that then I can come in and use a set of hand files and uh, we can reshape that and make it look much nicer For this job, we need to go into uh, Granddad's toolbox here and pull out some old-fashioned tools. And again, these are just things that I've accumulated literally from my grandfather. Some type of old set of really um, durable files. And this is one, for example. And this set has quite a few different ones. And I will use these little tools to shape my input right here by hand. All right, we're looking like we're getting really close here. Just need to expand the sides a couple of uh, millimeters and then shape up that gooseneck there that's what i like to call the curved end of there all right so uh, this is the actual board right here and i've got a couple screws let's see how this will fit in reality right now should be able to yeah thread those th through the holes and get that lined up and screwed in well i've got it mounted in there what do you think it's pretty solid we got it right over that uh brace point so we're not going to affect that or anything else plugs up top that's nice and safe and out of the way and it's not easy again to shape the scart input but i think we did pretty good by hand i mean the majority of it looks nice it's not like you're going to sit back here and stare at your scart input all day are you well it's test time what we've got running right now is composite video out of the Super Famicom. Obviously the volume's working fine, I'll turn that down. So what I'm gonna do now is, before I do anything else, I'm gonna switch to a different channel. And there we go, channel three, we've got the N64. Just get a game booted up on there. Just wanna make sure that everything's working. And I'll show you what I got going on back here. Um, what I've got is that's 
the RF that's feeding in right now. Here's our composite video. And then there's our RGB input right there. Let's do this. Let's unplug the RGB or let's unplug the composite. See if I do that. All right. That's definitely RF. All right. Let's go back here and press video. We're back on here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to undo this, turn it off, back on video one, and then we'll pop in. Let's pop in this one. This is the RGB cable. Ah, there we go. And just like that, we got RGB. Boom. Everything's working great. Awesome. Unlike the last television, that JVC, that I RGB modded, this Sony has great sound. Speakers are much better. Alright, everything is just working wonderfully on this TV set. I've been letting it run for about an hour. Now I do want to point out a couple things. There's definitely the uh, vert or horizontal shift going on here. So you can get into submenus and do a horizontal change on there. Or you can use external equipment, like an Xtron. But I would recommend doing that only on the composite video signal, as opposed to the trying to do that on RGB, because this is a MUX mod, so it needs voltage to come down a certain pin from the sink. Or not the sink, I'm sorry, it's looking for voltage anyway, in the uh, SCART head. But, good old Ethel, that's what I'm calling this CRT, good old Ethel, she's worked out nice, cleaned up, much better shape than when she arrived, um, covered in soda pop, and again, I have everything plugged in the back here, in the input board, just so I can make sure that nothing would really inhibit the other. Composite's fine, so is RF. And then SCART me. It just slips right in there and starts working. <clears throat> if you have the console torn, plugged in and turned on, it'll just come right on. Yep, this is a wonderful CRT now with RGB. Paul and I really do appreciate that you guys would stay around and watch this entire video. Please, if you did enjoy it, do me a favor and drop a like. If you really, really love CRTs and want to get more involved, you can always come and join um, the Patreon that I have linked in the description below. That's a way to connect with me and also get in on some of the community stuff that we have going on over on Discord and other things. But either way, thank you for hanging out and watching and caring about the CRT and us over here retro tech we love what we get to do and it's all really because of you that we get to do it thanks again and i'll see you guys next time with some more retro content more crt content is available right here here's some too